coming in here today. It's good to see you. You guys are in for a treat. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, we see attendees rolling into the webinar here. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our conversation pretty quick. So, um, Christy, you want to go ahead and give us the, the lowdown and what we've got going on with Coffee at 10? Yeah, so good morning. As many of you already know, I'm Christy Wodek. I'm Education Outreach Director from our Traverse City location, and I'm joined by Liz Erlewine, our Visual Arts Director from Petoskey. So thanks for coming today. Um, you know, I'm, I love all of our guests. Uh, this Delita, who you're going to get to know in a few minutes, I went down a rabbit hole hard, but this is one that I am not regretting and you guys are, you're just in for a treat. So uh, first we wanna thank our sponsors. We have Roast and Toast in Petoskey and Higher Ground Trading in Traverse City. At the conclusion of today's Coffee at 10, I will do a drawing. I have your names in here already. So please stick around so that we can um, get your contact information once we are done. You are muted as um, we have in all of our webinars. So please use the chat panel to ask your questions. And I told Liz, we're gonna have to be really careful because I think, well, I think I could talk to Delita myself just for an hour. So, you know, when you throw in Liz and I having this conversation and your questions, we just wanna be really mindful. Um, so pop those questions in there and um, we'll be answering them. As we're talking, Liz and I will add in links. Um, there are lots of links and they will be worth going back to after uh, we conclude this conversation. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Liz. Hi everybody, good morning. I'm so glad you're here with us today. It is my true pleasure to um, bring our guest, Delita Martin, to you today. Um, I have known Delita for many years, more years than it would take me a little time to go back and count, um, but it has been uh, such a joy to watch her career blossom over these years and see the true impact that her creative work and um, really organizational mind too has um, started to make a difference in, uh, in the art world here in, in the US. Um, so Delita Martin is an artist currently based in Texas. She received a BFA in drawing from Texas Southern University and an MFA in printmaking from Purdue University. She is formerly a member of the fine arts faculty at UA Little Rock in Arkansas, um, currently works as a full-time artist in her studio, Black Box Press. Martin's work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally. Most recently, um, Martin's work was included in the State of the Arts, Discovering American Art Now, um, but also an amazing show just this spring um, that we'll be sharing uh, as well and, and looking at some upcoming um, projects too. So um, thanks very much uh, for coming here today. Um, and uh, Delita, go ahead and say, say hello. Well, hello. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate being here. I was so excited when Liz reached out to me. And I was like, yeah, sure, because I love talking shop, um, love sharing what I do. So I'm just excited to be here. So That's fantastic. So I'm going to prompt you. What I'm going to do a little different this time, I'm going to go ahead and just prompt you with a question. And then I know Christy is chomping at the bit with questions too, so I'll try to back off a little bit. I'm going to prompt you with a question, and I'm going to share a screen and show some of the images um, of some of your recent work. So mm -hmm. our attendees who maybe are, who are not familiar with your artwork can get a sense of what you do. So I'm going to throw those images up here right now, Delita, and I want you to go ahead and think about and share with us a little bit about your beginning journey, how you got started as an artist, um, what influenced you, um, and all of that wonderful stuff. So go ahead there while I pull these images up. Right. Well, um, I, I started drawing when I was like five years old. So I have been an artist all my life. Um, that was around the time that I actually declared that I was going to be an artist. And I didn't really know what that meant but um that's what i had decided you know it started off with really coloring books and then i started um copying the images out of coloring books and then i think i must have been around maybe mm, i think about seven maybe six or seven when i realized that my father was an artist he was a painter and um he also made furniture and um, all of these creative people in my family, they're poets, they are writers, they're um, visual artists, quilt makers, storytellers. So, um, you know, when you grow up in such an environment, 
you tend to kind of take it for granted um, in the sense that it's just always there. And that's how I grew up. And so I got to a point, I think I was around maybe 12 when I was like, oh, wait a minute, my dad's an artist, he paints. And so we started uh, working together in the studio. I would um, literally watch him draw and I would try and draw what he was drawing. Mine would not look as good. I would ball up the paper and start over. He'd never say anything and I'd start over like a hundred times. But um, that's how I started. Um, so I knew I was gonna get a undergraduate degree in um, art. Um, it ended up being drawing. And then I began to think about graduate school and I was like, you know, I really want to study printmaking, but I had no idea what printmaking really was um, until I got to Purdue. That was my first experience with printmaking. So during the day I sat in on undergraduate classes to learn process and at night um, during the graduate classes, I would work on my work. So it's been an incredible, amazing journey, but that, that was my start. I had the opportunity, Delita, to watch your conversation. Um, do I? Do we pronounce it Gallery Murdas? How do we pronounce it? Murtis. Okay. Yes. I uh, had the opportunity to watch that conversation, and I, I highly recommend everybody once we're done to go check out that conversation. I've already put that link in here, but I, you, your day was incredibly long. You had an. I think you said you had an hour commute and you were starting very, very early. So I, you know, I think most people think that when you go into a graduate program, it's something that you already have no, some it was, experience it was with. Really exhausting. So I would leave home around five in the morning. Um, I would I was in Indianapolis and Purdue. I was on the campus in West Lafayette, Indiana. So that's an hour drive. So I would drive to school. Um, I'd get there maybe between 6.30 and 7. I would hang out in my studio until my day started. And <clears throat> I would teach classes. Usually my classes were scheduled in the morning. And um, I would sit in on the undergraduate printmaking classes during the day. And my classes, our classes, I don't think they ended until like a what, nine possibly at Ooh, night? Long days. And then I would take that drive back to Indianapolis. So it was really hard, but it was something that I was committed to because I love what I do. And um, it was just, it was worth it. You know, every experience that I had, you know, it was hard, but it was worth it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I'm sure to some level that drive, that commute, your ideas were percolating and you were starting to, to formulate a little bit. Although I did, you did say you don't like to go into the studio with too much of a plan. I don't. Um, I, I generally don't. I, what was interesting, I think, about that time was it was a struggle for me because I had not ever worked in printmaking before. I was primarily drawing and translating my drawings into printmaking was extremely difficult for me and figuring out, um, I just couldn't get it. And I think I spent the first semester with really bad critiques because it just, it, the translation was off and I finally got it. <laughs> um, you know, I finally, I, I was finally able to figure out the language, you know, how to translate, um, my previous work into um, into printmaking, but also in a way that would allow it to grow, which was very important. So it was a struggle. That first year was, wow. So, so what, you know, Christy, real quick. Um, I'm really fascinated. My background is in printmaking also, and I'm curious what drew you to that at your graduate level, right? Mm -hmm. How did drawing an undergrad, and like, you know what? Printmaking is where it's at. And then I'll pull up uh, your image again and you can describe maybe how printmaking is still part of your work. Well, the thing was I had in undergrad, we had a printmaking. Printmaking was actually a requirement for us to graduate. However, we never had enough students to make the class. And so they would substitute printmaking with um, scratch board and, you know, just anything other than printmaking. And so, um, I had a very interesting professor and I, it was two of us in the printmaking class and we were able to complete drawings on stones, but we never got a chance to process those drawings. 
But prior to that, I think what drew me to that was I um, had an opportunity to see uh, Dr. John T. Biggers, who founded the art department at Texas Southern University, along with my professor, Harvey Johnson, um, Charles Kreiner, who is a Houston-based um, printmaker as well, letterpress printer, printmaker, and um, uh, Early Hutnall, a photographer. And they were in the studio one Saturday morning when I went in to pick up a sketchbook or something. And I just kind of poked my head in the printmaking studio and Dr. Biggers was reopening an edition that he had done and um, Kreiner and Harvey were, um, <clears throat> they were printing this lithograph and one was wiping and the other was rolling. And Hutnall as a photographer was photographing the process. And so I literally came in and sat on a stool and watched them. And I looked at all of these chemicals on the table, um, the stone. And to me, it was just this magical dance language exchange that was happening among these artists that I admired. And I just made a mental note to myself, I'm going to learn that. I don't know when, but it's going to be a part of my process. But that was, that was a memory that just sticks in my mind. And it was like, I have to learn how to do printmaking. And so when I got to Purdue, um, I was scared to death because I had no idea what I was in for. And so the stress of that, the stress of trying to um, create work that was um, viable, that was, it was a really hard first year, to say the least. Yeah. Do, were you going to show share some more images, Liz? Sure, I'll share those images again. And then, um, Delita, maybe you can tell um, so those of us in attendance a, a little bit about how printmaking is impacting your work now, because it's really a, a mixed media process, right? Yeah, it's a mixed media process. Um, I do a lot of layering in my work. So um, one of the things that I've done in terms of the growth in my print making process is to really think about the idea and the definition of printmaking. So when you think about printmaking in general, you think about repetition, you think about layering um, and the, just the process itself, you know, using um, <clears throat> charcoal or using a litho crayon versus a charcoal. So still having the concept of printmaking as your base, and then also at certain points bringing in printmaking. And I think one of the struggles for me was as um, as an artist, you know, you're you're taught in school if you're a printmaker, you make prints. If you're a painter, you paint. If you draft, you know, if you're if you draw, you're a draftsman. You know, you you're taught to kind of uh, stay in your lane. And so when I decided to leave the university, one of the things that I wanted to do was to really um, challenge myself. And I was like, how do I do that? And I did that in several ways. I, I challenged myself in terms of size of the work. I challenged myself in, t in terms of the content and the context of the work, as well as the medium. And so when I talk about the medium, I wanted to be, a, I wanted to create. I didn't want to go in the studio and just be a printmaker. I didn't want to be um, a painter. I didn't want to be just any of those things. I wanted to create. So I literally had to tell myself every single day during that first year of, of going into this mixed media work that, you know what, it's okay. This is your world. This is your table and you're inviting people in and it's okay. You can do what you want. So um, this particular piece that you have up between worlds is um, it's the, the background is painted, but there's also uh, printmaking. Uh, one of the smaller patterns that you can barely see just above the head, um, oh, above here. the head is, um, is printed, is an actual printed um, block. And then um, there's, it's a charcoal drawing. There's fabric and paper. I treat fabric and paper very much the same. Um, I stitch in my work. All the work is hand stitch. And this piece is, I want to say 72 inches in height and maybe 51 and a half or 51 in width. And then uh, there's gold leaf 
um, there, you know, her eyes are actually painted. So, you know, I, in my studio, I determine what's a print and what makes printmaking and that's okay. And I think um, I've, that was the freest I had ever felt as an artist was finding my language um, and, and not allowing myself to um, be told how to speak. So this piece is called uh, Trinity and um, it, it talks about balance, about spiritual balance. Um, the bird that you see in the, in the uh, circle, which is actually a moon. And if you look closely, that is a relief print printed on top of a lithograph. And also if you go up a little bit to the mask, the mask is actually a relief print on decorative paper. And so I bring all aspects of printmaking in. Sometimes I print directly on the, on the paper. Sometimes I print um, on other papers and sew those into the work. So um, that's Trinity. And this piece, um, the star pattern that you see um, that's that you see somewhat in the figure, but primarily in the um, background. That is a relief print. Um, the solid colors are painted, and then you have the charcoal drawing, um, the decorative papers, the um, and the fabric as well. So it's it's really just uh, makes me. If I can't paint it, I draw it. If I can't draw it, I print it. If I can't print it, I will find it in another work and um, deconstruct that work and sew it into the work. So it's really about being able to tell a story and express what you're trying to say, and not being um, not using your medium as a crutch. So Delita, there's a couple of questions I have that are still process oriented. As we look at these images, I'm really excited to dig into content. But while we're hanging on your medium and the way you work, um, first you mentioned, or you and Christy were talking about how you don't really like to go into the studio with a really predefined idea of what it is that you're gonna walk out with. Um, but these pieces really do require a lot of thinking ahead in some ways. So how, can you talk a little bit about how, or you don't think so. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about how the piece evolves? And then I'm gonna throw in there that you've multiple times told me how you prefer to work on the floor. So if yeah. you could talk a little bit about that too, I think that would be um, Yeah, so I, I really don't think it takes as much preparation for the piece when you're allowing something to work through you, it tells you how to work. But what you do need to understand are the processes that you use. Traditional printmaking process, I needed to understand that in the most traditional way as possible in order to take it and do what I needed to do with it. Um, same thing with drawing, same thing with painting and any other of the mediums that I bring into the work. You have to understand it at its very base level, at its traditional level, and um, be able to, um, I guess, work as proficiently as possible in that level, you know, within that process, if not master it. And once you do that, um, you can make it do anything you want it to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't go in with preparation per se, I have maybe, um, I guess I've developed, um, you know, I do the background, which I refer to as the veil scape. That's usually how I approach it first. Um, I just recently changed that. Um, so it's just, it's, it, at that point, it becomes a habit of the order in which you work, but the order is not um, necessary. It's not, um, I don't use it as a crutch to say it has to go this way, this way, this way. Um, I love working on the floor. Working on the floor, um, because I work so large, it's almost um, a meditative process in that I become one with the work. So when I come out of the studio, I'm like covered in everything. I mean, it's, it's an intimacy that takes place with the work that um, I, I'm not able to capture, you know, putting the work on the easel or, you know, keeping it pent on the wall. Uh, 
I have an intimacy with the work being able to sit on it and, and, you know, lay on it and roll over on it and everything else. We have a couple of process questions popping up in our chat. Um, okay. One of our attendants is mentioning that you use charcoal and then are you using a fixative with that to hold it in place? Okay, so when I talked about knowing your medium, what I have found is that sometimes depending on what you lay down first, um, what type of paint you use, what brand paint you use, charcoal sometimes can seal itself, which is mm. blows my mind. And I don't know the chemical reason behind that. But I also use a golden, um, it's not a fixative, it's a, um, gosh, uh, it just escaped my mind. I do use okay, but it's a, it's called, the brand is golden and it's a spray yeah, something? It's a, it's a varnish, varnish. And they have oh, it good. in matte or, um, or gloss finish. I prefer the matte finish, but, um, it works great with the drawings. Um, fixative, you know, it doesn't really do anything for me, but I do spray them as I go and you have to do a lot of layering there has to be a lot of push and pull because the the varnish and even the fixative to a certain degree will wash out your charcoal and dull it and you have to be careful with that hmm. but there's always going to be some transfer it's not going to stop it from transferring so I don't put too much stock into it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what um, is your substrate are you using a paper because you're stitching so Yes, I love paper. Um, I, I don't know that I'll change anytime soon, but I've always worked in paper. Um, I'm using an Arches cold press um, heavyweight watercolor paper, and I buy the paper in the roll. Mm. Um, I love paper with that has a tooth to it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I've always worked on paper. And clearly it withstands, I mean, you're doing multiple layers. Yes. You're really manipulating yes. just layer upon layer. So that's great. That's great. Let's see. We also had another question and I think we're, we'll uh, be getting into the, uh, the importance of pattern. But before we do that, just looking at your pieces, I really feel you are creating art that's so special because there is a conversation happening within the canvas or the paper. I, I envision this conversation between you and the piece as you're creating it, but then once it's, it's, it's finished, it then becomes a conversation between the viewer and, and the artwork. So um, with that, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, that's one of the most, I think for me, you know, we all have those, um, I guess those measuring sticks you know, in, in our um, process or in our studio um, creativity. But for me, when the work, when, when the viewer is able to have a conversation with the work, I've done my job. Um, what, the, what that conversation is, is to me is not as important, but you know, I always say art changes minds, art changes hearts, and it challenges people to think. And when you change minds, you know, you can change structures and you can change environments and you can change things and when you change those things you change the life you know you change everything around you and so that's why the conversation is so important um i use a lot of symbolism in my work mm -hmm. and where this symbolism is very personal to me it's not beyond the realm of anybody who views the work um, I use birds in my work. I use safety pins in my work. I use bowls in my work. I use masks in my work. And all of those things cross gender. It crosses religions. It crosses, um, you know, racial boundaries. It's a conversation that anyone can have. It's personal to me. And as an artist, I don't have an issue with sharing with you um, what that means to me. But to kind of, I think, I enjoy going to exhibitions where my work is and just kind of stepping to the side 
and maybe hearing people talk about the work because I get to hear an honest conversation like, oh my gosh, you know what? My, my grandmother used to make quilts and that's the pattern is very similar to what she used. That's the conversation, the conversation started. Or, you know, I saw a bird like that. Or, you know, these circles remind me of that's when the conversation begins. And that's what I'm looking for. I've done my job as an artist at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, so the, the question from the attendants um, was about pattern and it's um, just saying that it does seem to be a visual, uh, an important visual element in your work. Does the pattern influence you first or is it all about the overriding idea? And um, bringing those two points of conversation together, I've wondered, and, and, and the comment that you just shared about, you know, referencing quilt patterns and things like this, can you talk a little bit about whether the patterns themselves have symbolic value to you? Um, sometimes they do. Um, one of the main patterns that you will see in my work is there's always a circular pattern in my work. And circles represent are symbols of the moon and the moon represents the female. So there's always a female presence in my work. So, um, and that's whether it's a male figure or a female figure, the, um, there's a female presence. And so that's very important. In terms of what those patterns dictate, I work in layers and I have over the years been able to, and it was really hard at first to block out something that you've already done and imagine it not being there in order to create the next layer. And that's what I do, that's how I approach. So the pattern goes down for the veilscape and then once that happens, the figure comes on. Well, once the figure comes in, the pattern, there's a play between the pattern and the figure that takes place but neither dictates the other. Um, I try and work with them in a way that they work together. So it initially goes in, you know, without, there's not placement, in other words. There's no, you know, I guess, there's no conscious effort to place the figure. I like to work with what happens once the figure is, is on the page. So I'm more concerned about centering the image or, you know what, I think I'm gonna have her more to the left or more to the right than I am about where she fits into the pattern. When you describe it like that, it just reminds me of my early relationship with painting, right? I mean, and you're just playing with that plasticity of space when you're just yeah. enjoying the material for what it is. And so it's fun to see how in some ways, I could now just argue that really you're just painting, Felita. It doesn't matter what those materials are. And you know, I have another artist friend of mine, um, and he always tells me that I'm a painter. And I'm like, no, I'm not a painter. Don't say that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, and it's so crazy. And I'm not saying that, you know, be, I'm only saying it because I've always secretly wanted to be a painter, <laughs> but I would never show my paintings to the world. And I'm just like, I'm just not that confident in the paintings that he's like delita you're painting i'm like no 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 don't say that don't say that but i would love to be a painter so funny oh we've so got questions popping up left and right christy have you been uh i yeah i i was just going to ask about your figures that um you use in your work are these models are these um family family members Yes, the work has taken a shift. So early on in my work, um, the women were very much symbolic of, you know, the great mother icon, the whole idea that all women are connected as one. And so they were very much a compilation of many different women in my community, in my family. So my mother's eyes, my grandmother's lips, my sister's posture, all of these things um, created these women. And so I have began to refer to these women as spirit women. Whereas now um, I became interested in, because um, I've, I've never been interested in portraiture in the traditional sense. I'm always interested in capturing the spirit, which doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, it doesn't, I'm not a hyper-realist artist. In my work, I don't find it necessary. Um, I went to visit an artist um, in undergrad and um, she had invited a group of students over and there was a portrait on the wall of her. 
and the portrait was by Dr. Biggers. And I remember looking at it and it looked absolutely nothing like her, but it, he captured her spirit and you knew instantly who it was when you looked at it. And that is the thing that I'm interested in. But I also became interested in how we interact with the spirit world. What does that actually visually look like? And so I have um, asked models to come in. I've used family members. And some of those, um, I've, I've transitioned them. My work is very much about how we transition into the spiritual other, how we become our spiritual selves. And so when you see the figure interacting with the patterns, that's what's happening. She is, he or she is transitioning into spirit form. And so um, I was interested in that. And then there's also some images where I've had models and then I've had them um, paired or, or reacting or interacting with spirit figures in the work as well. So the second image that you had, Liz, Trinity, is very mm -hmm. much um, about that interaction. So those three, two of those are my nieces. Um, I'm sorry, if you go, okay. yes, Trinity. And um, they're watching the center figure, who is my niece who came in to model for me. Um, she's, she's transitioning into her spiritual self, into her spiritual other. And the other two figures are like her guardian. There's this mm. balance, the idea of the Trinity um, that's happening. Um, the idea of the Trinity that's happening in, um, you know, in, 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 in this, this space, in the spiritual space. So the background patterns that you see is a, is a, is a space. It's, it's the space between the spirit world and the waking world. Delita, you know an interesting, um, we have an interesting question from the chat that I'm gonna paraphrase. So attendee, if you don't like the way I paraphrase this, please expand and I'll get it the way you want it. But um, the question is about um, finding your voice. So um, for you as a creator, um, you know, a lot of us, maybe we begin learning that technical skill or thinking about how to master our material or create something beautiful. When and how did you get into finding content was a really important piece of your work or how you found the voice of the stories you wanted to tell or uh, conversations you wanted to start. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think um, I paid attention to myself, you know. Um, every so often I will pull out all of the work that I've done at a certain point in time. It, it, you know, and it's not anything that's really scheduled, um, but I do a self critique and I think about, you know, I have, you know, X amount of work out. What is the common denominator? What do I see most in the work? And then I have to ask some very personal questions of why. Why is this happening? You know, why is this particular color showing up so prevalent in all this work? Why is a particular pattern showing up? Um, so when you start to ask those questions, then you start to dig deeper and you, you begin to understand why you do what you do, because we don't, put anything on canvas, anything on paper, anything we do, we do it. There's always a reason for it. And it's just a matter of you understanding uh, what that is. And in order to understand, you have to ask some very personal and oftentimes very tough questions of yourself. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Um, it, it makes me think of, of grad school, right? Where it often <laughs> felt like, okay, you're supposed to read this art theory and therefore it influences the work that you create. And right. it's fair, maybe that's floating around in there somewhere, right? Well, I, I think it's, it's important. Learning through your work, through your I think, and, and I don't want people to get me wrong, but I think that um, all the things that we learn in graduate school and undergrad is extremely important. And I think, um, you know, the, the readings that we do are very important, but I also think that, a, that there's a certain point, and I think it's different for every artist, that you have to let go of that. You have to glean off the information you can use and discard the rest. You have to become your own. And I think when I left um, teaching and I decided to go into the, 
studio full time, that was one of the most difficult things for me to do was to let that go, to become my own artist and to find my voice and be confident in, in what I was saying as an artist, being confident, being responsible in my content, in the context of my work, um, you know, having a level of professionalism, all of that, you have to find your balance. And, um, you know, at some point, you know, you kind of set academia over to the side. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess where I'd like to transition with this then, um, I think there's a lot more that we could talk about individual pieces and symbolism there, but you actually opened a door that I want to go ahead and follow, which mm -hmm. is talking a little bit about slightly the business of art, but also just the the complexity that goes into how we we make a difference with art, right? So with that, I would like to open the door for you to talk about your recent project, um, which is art as um, activism. So I'm going to pull up those other images and you can tell us a little bit about it. So first, let me say, um, you know, I spent probably a year trying to figure out how to make art a business, how to take something I love, turn it into a business and not hate it. Because, you know, we're taught to hate jobs. You know, you hate your job, you hate your career because it's work, but that's not always true. You know, I wanted to continue to love what I do, but I also needed to figure out how to make it sustainable. So there's the whole business side of art which is probably a whole nother show, <laughs> but um, there is a business side of art. And as artists, we can't disconnect from that. You have to learn that and you have to figure out where you fit in. And I think as artists, we, we're kind of at a disadvantage because it, like most careers, you go to college, you get your internship, you take this first job, you have the second job, and then you can move on to this area. There's a path. Um, we have to kind of create our paths. And so it gets a little tricky for us because there's nothing, everybody's path is different. Um, and sometimes success can come in the most crazy ways that that's not, you know, part of the plan. So, um, so I managed to, to kind of figure that out. I'm still working through some things, but um, recently um, I was in the studio and, um, you know, we've had such, political and social upheaval. And, um, you know, I was talking to my son, I have a 17 year old son. And like most parents out there, you become paralyzed when your child leaves out of the house. And, you know, as a young black man, it scares the hell out of me um, to think that he might not walk back in. And so, you had, you know, the George Floyd situation was happening, um, you know, police brutalities, all, you know, it's, it's this, this ongoing thing. And so I wanted to talk to him about um, how he was feeling and how he was reacting uh, to what was happening. So I invited him in the studio and we're just really talking. So it was really a special moment because I, I was able to share with him my feelings and my fears for him as a mother. And I was able to understand him as the amazing young man that he's growing into. And in the process, it's like, hey, will you pose for me? And so he was like, sure. And so a couple of things, it's like, he wears hoodies all the time, which frightens me. Um, you know, he's an avid runner. And then, you know, you had the case in, in Georgia. And you know, it's just all these things are going through my mind. And so as we're talking and I said, well, I want to do an image of you and I really kind of want to address what's happening. What do you think we should put on your hoodie? And he said, let me breathe. And I was like, okay. And so we kind of talked through it. He posed and, you know, he helped me in the studio and I received a phone call. Um, someone was interested in um, purchasing the piece and I explained to them, no, that I was gifting it to my son in hopes that, you know, he would keep it and maybe use it as a conversational piece with his family. But um, as I was telling him, he says, well, why don't we make prints? And I said, okay. And I was like, well, 
I'm okay with that if you're okay with it. And, and we did. And we made prints and we decided that 100% of the proceeds for these prints would go towards um, helping artists to um, have exhibitions as exhibition support for making a difference. Artists who's, you know, using their work to make social and political change, um, we want to help them. And so it, it's, it snowballed into this amazing journey um, because we initially started off wanting to donate those funds to a charity. And during my research, I couldn't really find anything that, you know, really kind of focused on what we had talked about. And so I was like, you know what? It's not out there. And if I need it to be out there, someone else does too. So we are in the process of um, setting up a not-for-profit foundation, Black Box Press Foundation. Um, two programs that we are working on is the Arts um, as Activism Fund, which um, we have managed to raise $70,000 for, which we're really excited about funding for those um, Planning for those exhibitions will begin in 2021, but we're also structuring a residency program um, for artists who are interested in printmaking and um, possibly letterpress printing, any type of form of printing that artists are interested in. So um, we started off, you know, willing to donate, and now we're trying to set up a structure in a way that we could help even more artists and organizations as well. So much is happening. It's like, I, I hope I got everything in there. So, so yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah that's, have... that's great. So if, if people wanted to get involved, what are the ways that they can get involved? Christy's already fed the link into the chat here to, so that they can find the Art as Activism Fund on your website. Right. So um, we are currently um, in the process of forming the not-for-profit organization. We had so many um, organizations and companies that are wanting to support us, and this is the best route for us to do that. But as of now, you are able to go onto the website. We um, had two sizes available. We had smaller prints that were available as well as the large prints. Um, all of the smaller prints are gone. So we do have the large, larger prints available in both the Let Me Breathe and Say Our Names. Um, are, these, are these signed digital prints? What are they? They are digital reproductions of the original pieces and they are signed and numbered. And um, they are on archival paper, um, beautifully, beautifully done. And um, those funds will go to support artists, individual artists who need assistance with creating. I mean, I, as an artist, you know how hard it is to get exhibitions and to get funded for exhibitions. And also small organizations who are interested in group shows, but they don't have the funding to maybe put the show on. You know, we want to assist them as well. Hmm. So. So please check out the, the fund. Absolutely. Yeah. Christy, do you have some, some more follow-up questions in that vein? Oh, I, honestly, I, we could just talk about so many different things. I just, I love that conversation. I just, it always, it goes back to the conversation with me, the conversation that you're having with pieces and that you're creating. And I think it's really beautiful that you have been able to find a way to have that conversation with yourself personally to create the artwork. And then it just, it's just, it's the ripple effect. So we're going back to a circle and it just keeps going out and out uh, with more conversations. Uh, we did have a question from uh, Gordon about the eyes. The eyes of the women you've depicted are so striking. Um, do you want to talk about your eyes at all? Interesting story. <laughs> so, um, my undergraduate professor, um, Harvey Johnson. Okay, so typically what I've noticed in a lot of schools when they teach you to draw, um, particularly figure drawing, you know, you, you sketch out the body, you do the dimensions. He always told us to start with what we were most interested about. The, you know, whatever interests us most about an individual. And for me, it was always the eyes. 
um, the eyes say so much without you having to say anything. And it's just something that I've always been attracted to um, when I meet people, you know, that direct contact and, and seeing them. And it's, it's just that your eyes say so much. And so I've, I always start there. And you said earlier about the, um, the soul and a lot of, you know, there's always the reference of the eyes or the, the doorway to the soul. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. We had right. a question early on um, that was in process, but we had started mm -hmm. to a different topic. Um, one of our attendees was asking about your use of fabric. Uh, yes. More technical questions about, um, do you wash it first? Do you keep, you start to keep it flat? Do you use cotton, other kinds of materials? Um, mostly I use cotton, but not for any particular reason. I think if I found another fabric that I liked, I would try and figure out how to make it work. Um, I do iron it out to make sure that it's stretched out. Um, there's this, um, I think it's like a pattern spray that you can buy at the fabric store and it's used to, I guess, um, kind of hold the pattern in place while you cut. I do use that sometimes to hold it in place while I stitch it. And um, I do a pre-punch on the outside and then I stitch. In. So. Oh, you do. Interesting. Okay. Someone just asked, have you ever made quilts? Your work would be a beautiful, it would be beautiful as a quilt. Sort of. Um, so stitching became very important in my work um, because my grandmother was a quilt maker and I would help her make quilts. And so during these times when we would make quilts, she would tell me stories. And some of the fabric that she had would be our old clothing, um, stuff that she'd saved. And there was always a story attached to these, these pieces of fabric. And so it was such a magical experience for me. I wanted to bring that to my work and I wanted the viewer to be able to experience these stories in the way that I experienced them as a child. And so I, would, I was in charge of cutting the fabric pieces and folding them for her. And she made this one quilt that she called her Rocky Mountain quilt. And she would cut out um, these squares and I would fold them into little triangles and she would stitch them. And she taught me one stitch, which she called tacking. And then she would go back and make a, a more secure stitch and that stitch that she taught me is the stitch that I use in my work. It's the only one I know, mm -hmm. so, sort of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we did have a question um, that talked, or that was asking about how your family influences your creative process. Um, so besides, you know, your influences of your father as an artist, and I feel like. And I might just be remembering in inaccurately, Delita, but I feel like in previous conversations we've had talked a bit about at least that um, female family line influencing uh, your creative process and your work. And obviously you mentioned the importance of womanhood, right, in, in your um, symbolism. Many of the images that I've seen are female figures. I wanna talk a bit about family and then also bring us back to, um, to that lineage a little bit. Yeah. Um I have very strong females in my family, um, very, um, very strong, the base of our family, really. And it's not to, um, you know, downplay the role of the men, but the women were just very strong and very powerful. And um, women in general, just historically, um, have been marginalized. And I want to talk about them in my work. I want to talk about, you know, my grandmother didn't work outside of the home, but her impact on the community and on me growing up was just as powerful as, you know, the first black female judge or, you know, the first black female bank owner, you know, just as powerful as those women. And I think that those um, stories are just as important to remember and have to be documented just as, you know, you know, these, these other things that we talk about. And so I felt like it was my, she was a storyteller and a quilt maker. And so I felt like she passed what she did on to me and I had to find my voice. I'm not a quilt maker, 
but I'm very much a visual storyteller. And so I feel like I'm, I'm still holding on to that tradition. And hopefully I've passed it on to my son, you know, in some way. But um, they, they're just very powerful women. And I felt like their stories needed to be told. And, and that's what I do. That's beautiful. Another question popped up that said, I mean, I could talk about art all day, but the question is, what are some things you do outside of making art to help your spirit and connect with inspiration? Well, that's the issue, because um, <laughs> according to my son and my husband, I, he, my son told me maybe two or three months ago, he's like, mommy, you read art books for fun. And I'm like, oh, and so sometimes I really have a very difficult time, not even sometimes, I just have a difficult time turning it off. Um, but I do meditate. Um, I have a space set up in my studio where I come in in the mornings and I meditate. Um, I read books, but they generally are kind of art related books. I mean, I try, I just, I don't know that there's really any disconnect between what I do you know mm -hmm. it's it's really hard I mean I just I it's almost to the point where I used to be like I need to find a hobby I need to find something to do and I can't so I just don't even worry about it anymore so it just all kind of blends together mm -hmm. well art is life right so exactly um and and then another question uh is your son interested in the visual arts it's interesting because he's, um, so we have this rule when he was little and even to now, we go to museums or galleries and he has to find one piece that interests him, good or bad, and he has to tell me why. Mm. Um, so, because I wanted him to be able to articulate, um, not just about art, but I think that helped in other areas as well. He is more of an engineer. Um, I could see he loves sculpture. He loves building things. So I think he's a creative in that respect. I can see him as an architect or something like that, but he's leaning towards engineering. So I was like, great. Maybe you'll be able to support your mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so we're starting to get to the end of our time together. So please, uh, attendees, if you have any other final questions to throw in the chat, please do so. Um, but as you're thinking up those questions, I want to go ahead and make mention of the show that you recently had this spring. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, Calling Down the Spirits and then what else you've got in the works? What's coming up? Oh, wow. Um, so right now, um, well, I did the, the Women's Museum, the National Museum of Women for the Arts um, in D.C. I had a solo exhibition there, which was incredible. Um, I had several new pieces that was in the show. And um, for me, the title of the show, Calling Down the Spirits, really talked about, because uh, several of the pieces in the show were uh, borrowed from collectors and it came with, and they were all from different bodies of work. So the title to me, um, I chose that title because it really talked about how I work overall. The whole idea of connecting with the work and being able to see the spiritual connection, whether it was an early piece or something I created yesterday. And so um, it was a very, you know, for me, it was a very powerful show. Um, it, there's an online exhibition. I think the online exhibition is still up. You're still able. And I also did a video um, of my studio, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a walkthrough studio, a little bit about process. And I answered some questions as well. Um, projects coming up. Um, I am working on a couple of shows, which I'll be announcing soon, but um, things were postponed, you know, once COVID hit. So we're just getting back in the groove of kind of, um, I guess, rescheduling those things. So I'm in the works of rescheduling a lot of different things. But in the meantime, I'm also, this time has kind of afforded me an opportunity to be in the studio and work with some other processes that I haven't worked with or haven't worked with in a long time and create new work. So still working and creating. That's fantastic. So we do have some questions. I'm going to try to order them. And, and Christy, um, 
be my wingman. Let me know if I'm missing something. So one question is, where can we view your work in person and uh, how can we purchase your art? So should that go to uh, your gallery in Baltimore? Yes, Gallery Martise in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm not sure that she's open right now. I think she may be open with appointments, but um, you can um, reach out to me via email. Um, I have a private viewing room that we can send a link if you email me at info at blackboxpressstudio.com. Um, that's another avenue for works. Um, so those two spaces. Great, thank you. And then we have a question from an art teacher. She says um, she uses visual journals in the process of helping her students develop their work. What role do sketchbooks or journals play in the development of your work? Okay, so I have to admit, <laughs> I've lied to my students my whole teaching. <laughs> keep, a sketchbook, keep a sketchbook, keep a sketchbook. I have a million sketchbooks with like one drawing each. <laughs> Um, I do not do pre-sketches in my work. Um, I go straight to paper. I can't do it. I've tried it. There's no preliminary work when I work. I go straight for the paper. Either it works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, I'll cut out what does and discard the rest and move on to the next thing. But I don't do prep work for my work. Mm. I, I can relate. <laughs> I, I get you. <laughs> I try. I try so hard. I do. I do. I try. And I felt so bad, you know, telling the students, you have to have a sketchbook. But I, it just doesn't work for me. Oh, that's great. And we just had a comment that said, you know, I'm glad to know that using a single page for sketchbook <laughs> is a universal thing. So you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can relate to that. Um, we're going to be wrapping things up. But if you want to hold up that beautiful mug that you were drinking from. Yes. Because so, um, I did a post earlier this morning for my morning mug shot. And I just recently uh, released five new mugs from my Shadow in the Garden mug line. And this is the Seeker mug that um, I featured this morning. So every morning this week, I'll be featuring um, a new mug uh, from that line. But um, I love mugs. If you guys, you know, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you will see my morning mug shot posts with all of my mugs. And I, I try, I mean, they're really funny. I love graphic mugs and so yeah so i think for those who aren't familiar with this she shared a mug that was her artwork but a lot of her mugs are just kitschy hilarious things that i don't know how you've acquired delita but i'm, sure I'm, kind, of like, I'm kind of like an app i'm kind of like a steve jobs app i have a mug for everything <laughs> it's like every it's like your memes your memes of facebook would just be like in mug form and got it so you got to check it out yeah and then it's like sometimes there's like the perfect opportunity and it's it just it's a mug moment you know so, but I figured if I love mugs so much and I was like, I want other people to love mugs. So I want to have all these mug collectors all over the world. So I was like, why not do a mug of my work? So there you, you go. You will see me at a future coffee at 10 with my own Delita Martin mug. I can't wait. I'm ordering as soon as we're done today. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Well, so hey gang, we're at 11. So here we go. Oh, wow. That seems like it was only 10 minutes. <laughs> Good. Is uh, Tom Teal, you are the lucky recipient of a $10 gift card. It could be, can you guys see that? Uh, yeah. It can be at Higher Ground Coffee or at um, Roast and Toast and Petoskey. So Tom, please share your information with us or uh, just reach out to us at Crooked Tree. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for joining today. We appreciate your support over here at the Art Center. We appreciate your future support for Delita Martin. We know it's a hard time for artists right now, but she's doing a lot of amazing things and making a lot of stuff happen. So we're grateful that you um, found time in your schedule for us, Delita. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and you guys can join us again in a couple weeks and we'll, we'll keep this series going. It's Thanks. good to see everybody. Thanks a lot, Delita. Thank Thanks, everybody.